Oh, now alive. Okay. It's time for Arrested DevOps, the podcast that helps you achieve understanding, develop good practices, and operate your team and organization for maximum DevOps. Jesus. Okay, let's do that again. It's time for Arrested DevOps, the podcast that helps you achieve understanding, develop good practices, and operate your team and organization for maximum DevOps awesomeness. I'm Matt at Matt Stratton on Twitter. And I'm your co-host, Bridget Kremhout at Bridget Kremhout on Twitter. If it isn't clear, I haven't actually been on the podcast for quite a while because I don't even remember how to talk on the show <laughs> right now. So go I'm ahead. just so excited you were actually able to join us. <laughs> I don't even know how to read my own intro. Arrested DevOps is brought to you by 10th Magnitude, a company that figures if you're listening to this podcast, you must be pretty cool, even if your name is Stratton. 10th Magnitude empowers businesses to better collaborate across teams and achieve IT transformation using cloud. They enable customers to innovate, automate, and accelerate by leveraging the power of Microsoft Azure. You can find out more at arresteddevops.com slash 10th Magnitude. This episode is also brought to you by Datadog, a monitoring tool that helps bridge the gap between operations and dev teams. Datadog brings together system metrics, changes, alerts, and events from over 70 common infrastructure tools, such as Chef, Docker, and AWS. So the dev and ops teams share their key data and alerts at a single place and collaborate on issues in real time. Datadog is available for a free 14-day trial at arresteddevops.com slash datadog. Sign up today and get a free t-shirt. Ooh, I want so, a free t-shirt. I, I know. We'll go sign up for a 14-day trial of Datadog. <laughs> Pivotal's already a customer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So we're, we're here tonight, today, whatever it is. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to find signal in the noise in the 2016s. Uh, joining us today is uh, returning guest Jason Dixon, although he doesn't remember that he was on the show before, apparently, or that we had video. And uh, also, when we apparently, if we the the recipe of you mix Jason Dixon with Pete Cheslock on a podcast episode and it results in debacle. So thankfully, Pete's not here. Uh, Jason, you want to tell the guests a little bit about what's up with you lately? Sure. In my defense, anytime you get me and Cheslock live on anything together, I'm probably drinking, so I, I have a, I have a decent excuse. Um, so I continue to do work with Monotrauma and open source projects like Graphite. Um, I'm kind of winding up my time with Librato, which is a uh, it's a metrics platform. It's monitoring as a service. Uh, a lot of customers use them for host-based or application monitoring. Um, I've been working out the last couple of years building out the integrations team and the integrations on the product. Um, I'm actually winding that down, and I'm about to transition over to uh, another startup, or a startup, called Rain Tank. Um, you may know them. Uh, they do uh, Torkoal of the Grafana project, actually works with them. He's one of the co-founders there, and they're doing some really cool stuff with open source and monitoring, so I'm really excited to, to start that next chapter there. Awesome. I'm so excited that you're on the podcast again, Jason. And for once, I'm like a host this time instead of being a guest on it with you. Um, we also have Anil Akani. And I'm excited because Anil is somebody who I think I met you, Anil, at Velocity a couple of years ago, was it? Yeah, that would make sense. And like your conference talks just have blown my mind. And then talking to you about monitoring makes me realize that there's tons of stuff I've barely started to explore. Um, so why don't you tell our guests a little bit about yourself and the stuff you're doing in this space. Sure. Uh, so my name is Neil Lakani. I work at a company called SignalFX that uh, also I'm monitoring as a service provider, uh, but it's very much focused on self-service monitoring and um, building alerting and uh, metrics visualizations around the streaming analytics platform. So it's primarily focused on uh, speed and providing a lot of flexibility to people. I've been in and out of this space for uh, almost 20 years now. 20, it'll be 20 years full-time ops-oriented stuff <laughs> next Tuesday. <laughs> That's oddly specific. Did something yeah. happen? Like <laughs> Yes. Um, when I turned 15, which is old enough to legally work in certain kinds of jobs, I got a tech support job, which I was doing at full-time after hours after high school, and I've been in tech full-time since then. So admit it. The truth is that's the day you installed Nagios for the first time. Yeah. Well, actually, it's the day I installed Debian for the first time. 
Nice. Well, and okay, so Jason. So wait. Actually... So apparently, I've been saying it wrong this whole time. So it's Nagios. It's not Nagios. Oh my God! Let's not talk about that. Uh, <laughs> that's a. Matter. I feel like I've heard people who work at Nagios Inc., which is apparently headquartered here in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, call it both. So is, I don't think it matters. Does anyone call it Nagios? Oh, that's my my favorite is Nagios. 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 That's right. <laughs> it, it's Nagios. pronounced. It's pronounced no. <laughs> well, and so that is actually where I thought we would start this discussion. Um, <laughs> <Just asylum. laughs> basically, I feel like, okay, from when 15-year-old Anil started doing this stuff, um, you know, 20 years ago, which, like, we, yes, we've all been doing this for that long, and it's depressing to think about, but um, when, when he started doing this stuff, monitoring was a very, relatively speaking, simple thing compared to how it is today, right? Because, like, it used to be you set something up to check on all your stuff, you knew what you were looking for, and you just kept looking to make sure everything was still okay. What's and, up, gold? Right? <laughs> and, like, now it feels like at least a lot of the hype cycle tells us that monitoring today is you have this giant fire hose and you have to apply some, like, machine learning to your internet of unpatched things or whatever. And so it's like this hugely diametrically opposed, you know, sphere of monitoring that maybe we're all headed towards or in. And I kind of feel like both of you two have a lot of insight into where monitoring was, where it's where it is now, like for the rest of us who don't work at monitoring startups and like where it's going. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. So And you're both just looking at me like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll start it off. I'll kind of like kick it off with like, and you mentioned this, I think, before we started the, the call today. But like Nagios, people are used to, you know, like, okay, here's this host or this service I need to monitor, and I'm going to do that. And I'm, I'm basically monitoring for how is it doing right now. And it doesn't, the problem that we found, and I'm going back to like my days at Heroku, was that you lose this context, you lose this historical context of how the service has behaved versus how it's behaving now. And I think that, you know, we, we got this, we, we developed this concept of the event stream, and, and you actually start to break it down, rather than just thinking of, okay, here's this software that we wrote in Nagios that goes out there, runs the thing like, you know, we, we expect a response, checks a response, and that's it. Now we're actually collecting metrics, and we can not only store those metrics, but we do things like window threshold queries, and, and you know, firing off alerts, or, um, I don't know, there's like these different components and over the last, I mean, I want to say going back six, seven years, you started to see all these different, and for the most part, open source projects um, focused on different components, uh, different functional areas. Um, and I think that that has kind of like led us to where we are today. And you're actually not, I think what, what has proven that out is that you actually have paid commercial services oriented around specific functional areas. So people understand that there's value in outsourcing just this particular area of the overall architecture and not just like, okay, we need to run, you know, IBM's big enterprise monitoring software or whatever. I'll, um, I'll take it a step further. So it's it's not just, uh, or the way we've done it in the past isn't just seeing how a thing is doing right now. It's, 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 it's what are you doing? What's the response? And between the times when you're asking the question, you have no idea how that thing is doing. And you're only asking the question of the one thing. You're not asking the question of the cluster. You're not asking the question of the service. You're not asking the question from the point of view of the user's experience. All you're doing is, are you up? Yes, I'm up. Are you giving me the right HTTP response? Yes, I am. Are you giving me uh, the ping time I, I expect? Yes, I am. OK, great. But Unfortunately, that is insufficient. It's just, it's just if you know, if you're measuring yourself on uh, the on your actual live performance and on your historical performance and what changes are in performance and how you respond to real demand from real human beings using your product, that's simply insufficient. Yeah, and that actually, you, you touched on something that Jason also brought up that I kind of want to dig deeper into, this idea of expected or this idea of thresholds. So if you're um, setting a system that's kind of got a static threshold, uh, I feel like that's a way that it was very typical for people to do things that has serious limitations. 
Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail since you mentioned thresholds, Jason? And then yeah. um, hearing a little bit more from Anil's point of view, too. So I, I'll say that, that, and maybe this is going back a couple of years, you started to see this backlash, people talking about thresholding. It was largely around the discussion of how can we advance, like, uh, AI or, or you know, uh, machine learning around monitoring and get smarter responses. And, and that all has value. Um, I think you have to think of monitoring like people do with security, right? It's security in depth, and you have to approach it from, with different layers um, because there's no single answer that's going to tell you how your service is doing. It's the same reason why I'm a big, I shouldn't say big opponent, but I, I don't like machine la learning as like the solution. Um, it's a great like addition to your you know to your overall approach. Like there are times when you're gonna know what to expect from your system, and I think thresholds are fine for that. Um, I think any threshold is better than a static you know yes or no. It might how am I doing? Um, but I think all the machine learning you do, all the algorithms you see developed these days, they're all around okay, how is this thing performing? What is the expected band of performance, um, and are we seeing any anomalies? And I think that's great. I think it's really important. I think anything that helps uh, operations people, engineering people sleep, not to say that one can't be both, but that to help people sleep, to, to help them relax, and to keep their systems running um, is really important. And you touched on an important thing with the thresholding, too, and Neil did, um, business transactions or business kind of looking at it from a business perspective like am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing am I doing the work involved or the, the expected work of me as a system and not just am I getting a 200 or am I passing you know, or how many am I handling this many requests per second are you doing what's, what you're supposed to be doing and this goes back many years to a, a customer we had at, at, at Omni TI um, and I don't remember the exact quote but it was something to the effect of I don't care if my servers are on fire as long as they're making me money at the end of the day like that's what it's all about yeah yeah, I would agree with that 100%. I mean, a, a lot of people, and I get this feedback sometimes uh, when I'm talking to people about modernizing how they do monitoring. A lot of people seem to think that um, moving away from or, or not only using checks and static thresholds is something you only need to do if you're using uh, a lot of ephemeral infrastructure, if you're using auto-scaling on Amazon, if you're using schedulers like... Uh, Mesos or Kubernetes, etc., where some system takes action without you knowing it that involves the scale of your processes or infrastructure components. Uh, but that's simply not the case because you, you, I mean, to Jason's point, what you've always really wanted to know was whether or not the thing you were supposed to be doing, you were doing within some envelope, you know, within the range of SLA you're supposed to be providing or within the expected performance envelope that you that you think you need to be delivering in order to make money or to be a viable business or going concern. Uh, it was just that we weren't actually measuring that. And now we can measure that and we should. It's it's like definitely a context story and you know I I know, I know there's kind of differing bands of like how deep and crazy understanding of this some people have versus others. Some of this is going to seem super simple, maybe. But I, I you know, to, to your point about it, it doesn't matter whether you're ephemeral infrastructure or physical infrastructure or whatnot. If you don't have the context of what these things mean, you're going to interpret them the wrong way. You know, and I, again, reminds me of, like, I had a, a, a fellow sysadmin who, you know, back in the day and was freaked out because we had a database where he's like, this thing is running at 90% CPU. And we're like, that's what it's supposed to do because the thing that's taking up all the CPU is SQL Server doing its job. But what's happening is it's like, Jason, to Jason's point, we're still, we're making money, right? It's performing all the transactions, but we're not looking at it in context. And I think that's what makes it harder, right? Like you actually have to understand more than your your thing. And then that, that leads me to a question that I have is that then what people want, I feel like, or I get asked for a lot or they kind of want to tie it into, because everyone's in love with dashboards. Dashboards are cool. I understand it. I, they're awesome. But this idea of, uh, and the phrase that kind of gives me a little bit of the crawlies is single pane of glass, right? And I kind of always want to ask, how big is your pane of glass? Because you want to put everything in one place, but is there? there's no one visualization <laughs> of all these things. Like, I mean, what, the, the what single, do you see for that? I think the single pane of glass is specific to your role. Um, to the systems that you're trying to manage. Like, it's not going to be the same thing for everybody across the company, but I think it's important for those tools to be dynamic. Um, I, I, going back, I had an open source project called Descartes, which was, you know, it's a dashboard, it was, you know, whatever, it's a graphite dashboard. 
the, the, prior to that, like everybody was like declaring their things in configuration and making it very static and like this is what it's got to look like. You're trying to stuff as much stuff in there as possible. Um, actually, Descartes a bad example. Dusk is a better example. I wanted something that was very dynamic that allows you to kind of just like on the fly interpret the stuff, look at look for hot spots or anomalies in the thing. And so like Dusk was one of those. And like I'm a big proponent of like I love the single pane of glass, but on the other hand, I'm probably making your case now, man. But um, Something that on the fly, it's very meta. You can like look at it on the fly and say, okay, this is how my fleet is doing for this specific thing that I'm interested in, rather than having to look at a single pane of glass for everything all the time. Um, and I think if you look at like horizon charts, I think that's a great example of a very niche take, you know, piece of, of visualization that that is great for finding like those things. Like you're not going to use it to, to do kind of deep diving. But for finding at the surface layer, like what you know, what vector is, is a problem here? Uh, I think this can be really handy. Yeah, and, and I don't, and I honestly am uh, skeptical of the single pane of glass notion. As someone who worked at IBM for a long time and has seen many single panes of glass come and go. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I, I want to uh, echo what Jason said in that. For any given role, you want a single pane of glass, but all of all of the things that generate data and display data should not be walled gardens, because uh, you know your your BI people or your CEO single pane of glass might be Tableau, whereas as an operations person, you know it might be single effects or whatever, or as a marketing person, you might live inside of you know Marketo or Mixpanel. But what you do need is uh, all the data coming into and out of all of these systems must be able to come in and get out so that everybody has access to uh, basically composing their own view out of the things that are relevant to them and that are in a relevant context to them. Uh, that could be one thing across the entire organization, but it, it almost never is. I mean, there's some things the whole org's probably going to care about, like, you know, site shoppability. Um, yeah. If you have, like, a retail site and suddenly transactions drop to zero out of the blue, like, people are, yeah. everyone's going to probably care about that and want to know why. I mean, <laughs> everyone I, should, but that part of your problem is that's also putting into the context of getting people to care, right? Like, that's the value of, of doing this is that you're putting it in a way when you're, you're seeing that actual metric, where the problem is your organization are probably a lot of people don't care. They'll be like, well, yeah, that's or, a business problem, right? Well, hey, news news for you. You're the business, yeah. right? Maybe oh, I'm being it. naive, but I think if you're so, siloing your data within your organization, like, I think you have bigger cultural issues. Yeah. I mean, we I, I know plenty of examples where, for instance, uh, there's, a, there's a company that I work with that um, their, their fundamental metric for the business is... Uh, the number of documents that their users are opening in any given time period. That's a thing that they can correlate both to revenue, but also to uh, infrastructure, to the you know to their performance and capacity needs. And it, and it's it's one metric that everybody from the CEO down to network engineering looks at and pays attention to because it is the one metric everyone is geared around optimizing for. And making and making sure they can support. Now, I don't necessarily know that every business can come down to one metric. You know, if you're one business with one application, you can probably do that. But if you have many applications that you're selling, maybe not. Um, but I do think it's possible to to have metrics that are relevant to everybody, regardless of their role. Yeah, this is one of the things we've been hearing a lot from. Um, if you look at the the stuff that James Turnbull has been talking about with like the art of monitoring book that he's writing that's coming out very soon now I hope uh, one of the things that he's said in conference talks over the last year is you meaning you operations people in this room are not the customer of your monitoring like you're at least not the only customer like the the entire organization is going to want some of these results maybe they want them in a slightly different view or form than you want them but they're going to need and want this stuff and what I'm hearing from you is it should be, for me both, is that it should be self-service and composable. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was just about to say, I, I love the phrase, I shouldn't say the phrase, but I love self-service monitoring. It's something that we really 
uh, again, back to go back to my time at Heroku, is something that we're huge fans of. And like, if you're building out a monitoring service, it had to be designed in such a way that anybody can consume that. Like, again, you you don't want to silo this stuff. You want people to collaborate. Um, you know, a, a good example was like, so back in the day, like you're you're running Nagio, so you, anytime you add a service or something, you've got to you know commit this configuration and push off. Well, if if you're you know if the commit repository or for whatever, it's stuff is walled. Um, and you don't, you're not exposing that to the engineers because you're an operations shop and a DevOps shop or whatever. That's a whole other conversation. Um, it, how do you do that? And like, so we abstracted it out. Like, one of our developers built this thing that would query Graphite and return an HTTP response code, like 200, 300, 400, or 200, 400, 500. What was fantastic about that was then, then you could do something like Pingdom, and you could actually you know, put that query into this service and ping them, it would just hit that. And if it was a 200, then you know it's good. If it's a 400 or 500, you know it's bad. I um, mean, like, you didn't need to modify code to do that. So it, it enabled, it, you know, gave access, it removed those silos, and any developer could go in there. If they can run a graphite code, they can put up a check and alert in ping them within, a, you know, a couple minutes. Yeah, I think that's... the other thing is, uh, I was just going to say, like, not siloing that stuff off too. If you're going to take the the approach, um, and I don't know if he's the originator of the comment, but when John Sheehan was on our show a couple of years ago, he said, you know, monitoring is just testing with a time dimension, and that's just something I not not to say that to diminish what monitoring is, but I like to take that approach when I think about testing. Is if it's important, and I, what I usually tell my customers or people I'm talking to, it's important enough for you to be monitoring this in production, then you should be testing it, right? So if you've got, if you're, you're, you know, again, siloing it off and saying like, okay, well, monitoring is a thing we do once it's baked and it's released, and that's the only place where those walls exist, then how can you filter that into... So you need, first, you need, you need to go back and tell John that no, uh, it's actually uh, testing as monitoring without context. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I, you're, so you're, you, you have a very good point here. So our approach and what I've seen work and basically what all the engineers here do is because they're required to monitor their stuff with signal effects since they're signal effects engineers. Um, the metrics are baked into code from day one, from when the code is written. Is this, do I want to time this? Do I want a gauge on this? Do I want another response time? Like is this, is the performance of this thing relevant? Um, and and if, you know, in, at least in our for the way we do it, engineers do hold pagers in their own rotation. You know, if they're going to get paged for something they did or some other engineer did, and they have no means of getting access to visibility about what that thing is doing, whether it's a block of code or or a middleware kind of platform like a database system like Cassandra or Elasticsearch or something, um, or part of our front end UI, and they have to troubleshoot it. How are they supposed to do that if they don't know what that thing is doing? So the the idea of so to monitoring can't be or shouldn't be about is a thing up or down in prod. It's supposed to be about is is the service performing and and is all of the service performing and all of its various bits and pieces performing? And if you're going to do that, that should be baked in from the beginning. Because then how do you even know if um, modifications you made to the service have an intended effect? If, if the same metrics don't follow you from code through test, through QA, through Canary, through deployment, and into production. So I'm probably going to get myself into trouble here, but I'm going to ask anyways. So, Anil, what, it sounds like you're kind of in the similar mindset as I am. I, I'm an advocate of monitoring all the things, um, you know, starting off with your instrument, instrumentation with your code, you know, from, from day zero. Um, so I'm, I'm curious because I know that, that again, sorry if we're <laughs> getting a little too, too personal here, but, you know, signal effects and Lebrado are both metered-based pricing. They're usage-based pricing. Yeah. And that's really hard because like, you're, you're trying to convey to users that this is an important thing. Even if you're not using it now, you may use it one day. But on the other hand, like, you know, like I think – personally, I'm, I'm a big fan of metered pricing. Like, I think it's the fairest to the customers. But when you try to tell them that, like, okay, well, we have to, you know, you're going to have to pay this to monitor all those things that you may or may not need. Like, how do you how do you bridge that gap? Uh, so, from a purely business perspective, um, the way I explain it to people that seems to work is that uh, you you 
it's it's basically the amount of monitoring you're doing. So it's not the number of things, it's not the number of processes, it's the scale of monitoring you want to do. If all of these things are important to you, then you monitor them. And the nice thing about metering on usage in one way or another is that that gives people a significant amount of freedom to turn knobs. I can change the rate at which I'm sending data. I can change the amount of data I'm sending per object. If I find that a thing is not useful to measure, I can stop measuring it or measure it at lower frequency. If I find in the future that something is useful to measure, I can measure it at a higher frequency or begin measuring. And, and all that can happen without you changing the amount of money you're paying. Because you, it's you know, it's it's kind of like having bandwidth, right? You get you get bandwidth from, especially you know, if you're like, if you have any background with physical data centers, like I do, you get bandwidth from bandwidth provider. You use it however you see fit. The bandwidth provider does not care, and you're free to manipulate how that bandwidth gets used amongst your devices or things or apps or whatever, to your heart's content. Um, so, so what I find is that, for this to really make sense to people, it kind of comes along with a mindset of continuously iterating on what it is that you care about and trying to get closer and closer to the handful of metrics that actually matter for any given service or platform. Because I, I heard a really important word there, which is useful. And I feel like that's going to be something that an individual, consumer, you know, client, organization, whatever, of the metrics is going to have to determine on their own. Like, usually a vendor is not going to be able to come in and say, oh, this is your only and most useful metric. Like, you're not going to sure. necessarily be familiar enough with people's business case to know that's, that. That's probably the most common and yet hardest question to answer is, you know, when I was doing a lot of talks about monitoring, people would always ask me after the talk, like, what's the, what's the most important thing to monitor? How do I know? And I'm like, I'm not trying to cop out, but that's, like, you're the only one that's really going to know that. Like, I can give you some good examples, and, like, we talked about monitoring for the business, monitoring the workload, like, that's the easy answer. But specifics, like, you have to know your data, you have to know your systems, and that's why it's so important. Like, we talk about DevOps, like, that's why DevOps is important in one particular facet. It's like, you have to understand how your systems, you have to think like an engineer, you have to know what to expect of your systems and what you're putting into it. Well, and, and, your, and your mindset itself, your approach has to be non-static. Like, you have to just be all right with the idea of just... All of continue of just iterating, of just finding the new things out tomorrow that you did not know today that were going to change your behavior, change what you look at, change what you optimize for, um, and to some degree, you know, for for a thing that has become standard or widely used, you can say here are the things you should really be looking at from an operational perspective, but that only tells you about the operation of that thing by itself, out of context, without regard for the rest of what you're doing. Which is, I mean, like in Kafka. In Kafka, there's no metric for for average message size in Kafka, but it's important to know whether your messages are generally small or large, or if there's a change in the size of your messages, because that has a big impact and throughput in Kafka. Um, so that's a relevant bit of information if all you care about is Kafka, um, but it might not be relevant if the you know the things that are putting messages on the queue and taking messages off the queue don't care, or if they're designed to do something where message sizes are supposed to change over time and that has some meaning to the business. Yeah, or we, we were talking about Elasticsearch a couple of minutes ago and I was kind of having the, you know, Elasticsearch uh, cringe-worthy remembrance of, oh yeah, I remember when I set up a cron job that would just check every minute to see if the cluster had gone yellow. Because yeah. if the cluster's going to go yellow, later you it will go red and everything will be terrible. <laughs> yeah, you should not have to do that. I mean, so here's, here's the other thing about if we go back to checks versus metrics. So many cron you know, jobs that one should not need, and yet one needs. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, you're, you're effectively just checking every, every machine to see, you know, every node to see if it's, if it's yellow or, or even if it's red. And instead, you should just you should get a single cluster health state status of some kind, which well, does not exist. But, well, it was the cluster, you know, does the cluster right. have any yellow? But yeah. Right. But, but if, you, if you do checks on static threshold, you know, that's... 40 alerts, right, or however, for however many you have in a cluster. But if you're using a metric system and you're fundamentally focused on, on doing, you know, you know, analytics on on the data you're getting, it, then you're just like, just give me one alert when the damn cluster changes status, and don't tell me again until I change the status again. Yeah, I don't. I, I that's really important because I, we touched on it before the call, but you know, we start talking about like the whole cattle thing, right? Like these ephemeral systems and. and Especially as we, I hate to say this, but as we go from a, uh, 
still in its infancy kind of containerized world into the possible like serverless as, as F uh, <laughs> movement. Were, were we, we were just like, did we have an over under on when that word was going to come up? I, 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 know that's, that's I just, I have to have my little rant moment on serverless for a minute here. Um, <laughs> serverless is nonsense because there are still servers, you just can't SSH they're into not, them. I hate to break it to people, there are always servers. I mean, if, you see, I don't know if, it, if you saw the, the meme that I that I, I made like last week or whatever, which was like private serverless, and it's just an empty data center. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're right. We are we are moving into this like okay, just fire off a function, and that yeah. actually leads to fascinating questions about well, how do you monitor that? And you know, yeah. if you want to touch both, of you want to touch a little bit on how that whole containers to, like, you know, just kind of Lambda functions, how that changes the world of metrics and monitoring. I mean, I was going to say, like, Adrian Cockroft did this really good talk. Uh, he's probably done it a few times, but, like, over at uh, reInvent, I think, last year, about how, like, these systems, like, we're used to thinking of systems in terms of months or weeks or days, and then, you know, containers took them down to minutes or even seconds. Um, like, how do you monitor that? Like, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't even fire up a script for Nagios. So you can't cron that. Um, and, and even, like, systems like Graphite or, or, or Librat or even SignalFX, like, these things are ephemeral systems. Like, even though we're, think, we're starting to think of, of, of our metrics in terms of multidimensionality, like Metrics 2.0, like, still, like, these sources, these host names, they, they don't matter um, because right. the system, like, by the time I finish a sentence, that system's already gone. Um, so but, they're, they're, work, they're work units, right? So that so kind of takes to, us that takes us to the event stream, then. Right, right. We have to start thinking of this in terms of work, in terms of aggregate work. Am I performing that that thing? And like I said, I don't mean to keep coming back to that, but that's really what it amounts to is, like, we have this amount of work that needs to happen. How many compute cycles can I throw at it to get that work done? Okay, is it happening? And I don't know that there's a lot of great answers, like practical, pragmatic solutions around that yet, but I think it's definitely where we're headed, and I think people understand that. So that's, like, we've got a head start on that. Like, I don't think that's an alien concept to us. It's just actually building the systems and the software that allow us to serve it effectively. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, if if you're really going to go to, um, I guess, what people call serverless, or if you're going to go to a Lambda kind of system where all you're doing is running functions to do things, then, then you still know what you need to measure, right? You're, you're still measuring the performance of those functions, the timing of those functions. Are they responding in a sufficient amount of time? Is the experience delivered to whatever is downstream of those functions, what I need it to be or expect it to be? Um, the, the nice thing is once you start taking a metrics-oriented view that is focused on uh, service-level performance characteristics or, or, or really what Google uh, calls service-level objectives, which is essentially what this is talking about, uh, then changes in the underlying model of how you perform those functions don't change what you want to measure. They just change how you implement the act of measuring, uh, which you know, which is easy, relatively speaking. Once you know what it is that you want to get to, uh, but but I'd like to um, take a. Uh, like I said before, it's I don't think having ephemeral infrastructure is necessary or drives a need for for using metrics versus checks or having analytics or having multi-dimensional models. I mean, I um, we've got a customer that has 100 physical machines, each of which runs 20 to 30-ish Docker containers spread out over five locations around the world, and they are they're so precise, they've so precisely measured and watched their own performance profile that they have they don't need a cloud platform they don't need auto scaling they don't need ephemeral compute they know exactly how much performance they want and they deal with it directly in the fastest way possible on bare metal for the most part uh, but they but they still want metrics they still want to know what their error rates are and what their success rates are and whether or not they're within a performance envelope and when they approach the boundaries of the performance envelope that they want to be in. Uh, and they can't do that with checks. They can't do that with Nagios. So that kind of does bring us to the, like, we've talked about a lot of this from kind of a high level, but from, like, a tools perspective um, and, like, a more practical approaches perspective, other than, of course, give money to the, both of the companies you work at, which is a given. Of course, people should do that. But um, other than that, like, 
for both of you, if you're talking to people who are just now realizing, well, shit, I guess I need some of that metric stuff. I can't just be doing static checks. Where should people start? Like, what's the most, what's the fastest way, and maybe the most effective way, which may not be the same way, if what's people want to start? What's the most important thing, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, I think most people, when they're starting to learn a new ne technology, turn to open source, and I think that's the right approach. Like, until you reach that inflection point where you know that <clears throat> what you have doesn't solve your needs anymore, or if your time is better spent on your your, your business value proposition, then like, absolutely do it yourself. Learn it, play with it. Find out where the weaknesses are. Um, stress test it. Uh, once you're like, okay, I've got better stuff to do with my time. If you can outsource it to somebody like a Labrado, like a SignalFX, like a Rain Tank, Graphic, whatever, by all means, do it. Um, but I, I think get to that point because then at least you understand the technology, you, you understand the nomenclature, um, and, and you're, you, you know it's just easier to work with. Start with open source. Yeah. Become a more informed shopper. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree with that 100%. Um, I'll, I'll be even more specific. You know, if you have no idea where to start, look at Collecti as a collection agent just because of its such a large ecosystem of plugins and so many things that it works with and so many people work on it and it is uh, all things considered compared to every other agent I've ever played with ever in my 20 years in the space, stable. <laughs> um, I like how you have to uh, and, kind of qualify that. It's stable oh, yeah. compared to well, all the other things. Like, I, I, and Neil, you're probably in the same boat. Like, we've been around this this you know, industry long enough that we've seen a lot of open source agents out there. And the biggest problem with a lot of these is you know CPU and memory. Um, yeah. like, are they leaking memory and are they consuming CPU? Um, are you? It, it's what, what's the what's the law? Like, where you're, you're not affecting the systems you're trying to measure. That's Heisen, Heisenberg. Heisenberg. Yeah. Heisenberg. I think it's yeah. the observer yeah. principle. The yes. principle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, I think Collecti from my ex, from my experience is the one that's a, a, you know that that's gotten as close to that as possible. Like that's avoided influencing the system that it's trying to monitor. And it's it's written in C, so you know you use high performance. But to the the point about memory leaking, like, and this is not trying to be like oh you have to trust me on this, but like I've been an open BSD developer, and a lot of the people on the Collecti team are also open BSD developers. Like I trust them with with open source code more than pretty much any other kind of collection of people that I've ever encountered. Like yeah. they understand, don't introduce regressions, and they understand security, they understand network performance. So uh, that's personally why I'm a fan. Yeah. I I would I would say though that um, you should be careful with Collecti plugins, or at least you should watch plugins when you use them, which is true for any system that involves some core thing into which you have plugins, like browsers. Are, are you implying that, that user-contributed Python plugins and collecting are a bad thing? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, just sometimes if you install a plugin, things can become funny, which is true <laughs> in many other worlds. Yeah, um, But yeah, but collecting is a great starting point, and uh, honestly, so is graphic, because uh, they're easy. A lot of people understand them. Uh, they're they're relatively uh, self-explanatory. They're well documented, um, and there's a large support network around both. I've, I've I, had I good think... experiences with Statsd and putting Statsd stuff into Graphite too. I, I don't. I, I'm seeing a strange expression on uh, Mr. Graphite's face. So maybe you can give us some context around why we should or should not do such things. <laughs> I, I heard that somebody is writing a book about Graphite. <laughs> Tell really us excited. how is the book going? Tell it's us going about the book, well. Jason. Uh, so it's uh, there's one more chapter that I want to finish up. Uh, everything else is out there in a release format uh, by O'Reilly. Um, so I, I'm personally very excited. Um, you know, I, I clearly didn't do it for the money. Um, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I've been <laughs> That's what to everyone says. Everyone who <laughs> says everyone who writes a book is like, just so you know, don't do it for the money. <laughs> don't do it for the money. No, it's just you know, it's uh, it's an arduous but entertaining and fulfilling process. And as specifically the graphite book, it's like probably the only thing that I have enough knowledge in my brain about that, that would justify trying to get this out in, in book format. So it's pretty cool. Nice. And right. since we were since we were talking about tools, and you were mentioning like OpenBSD because you're totally that kind of hipster. See, I'm in the FreeBSD hipster camp. We can be hipsters. Oh my together. god! <laughs> but, no. but there are there are a lot of people. We have a lot of listeners who are like BSD. That sounds delightful. I'm using Windows. Windows 10 is awesome and exciting and new. So like, are there any tools you would recommend for people who are in that particular situation? Other than you can run Bash on Windows now. Right. Yeah. Sure. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Neil. In, in the Windows world, so uh, there's actually a, a collective port for Windows um, mm -hmm. that I believe was made by a team over at Bloomberg. Um, 
actually, I think there's more than one of them. The most recent one that I saw was by a team at Bloomberg. There's a uh, a Windows perf counter reporter that some of the engineers at SignalFX wrote for our Windows users. Um, and you can pipe data from those things into Graphite, into SignalFX, into all kinds of tools. Also, yeah, the one I know is... Oh, sorry, Matt. I was just going to say, you know, listeners, if you're doing some cool monitoring stuff with Windows that we haven't really talked about, feel free to kind of tweet it at us. We'll be we'll, we'll share that back out around as well. As my, my Windows monitoring background is uh, a little antiquated. It's been a while since I've worked for a living uh, in a Microsoft shop, so <laughs> it's, uh, I know it's gotten a lot better, uh, but I, I don't want to speak as if I could give a super awesome uh, uh, recommendation. Yeah, to add to Neil's comment, the, the other project that I'm thinking of by Bloomberg is called Collect D Win. Right. Oh, there's also Metrics.net, which is um, basically like Drop Wizard Metrics except for .net. Now I'm starting to feel like if only I were running Windows, I could monitor all the things. <laughs> oh, in Stratton, the uh, the um, statement from you, it's been a while since I've worked for a living, is almost certainly what I'm guessing Joe's going to go with for the cold open, just so you know. <laughs> either, either that or the uh, when I said I don't even know how to actually read on my own podcast anymore. <laughs> that was the cold open, though. <laughs> That's the thing. This means that people people now know if they work at a if they do arrest a DevOps, they can retire. There we go. Well, well, we, if, usually, if you come on the show, you get a new job and a promotion or something. That's been known to happen. That, Correlation, that causation, an appropriate topic for tonight or today. What the hell, it's that, like I know, right? Oh, uh, has no idea what day or time it is. I really don't. I haven't left my. Hey, hang on. S since you brought that up, can I can I circle back around to something Jason talked about earlier, which was machine learning? Please. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Tell so us I, about the tell us about the Internet of yeah. Unpatched Things and everything so, we can learn from it. So I've been around for a while too, and I've been uh, I have some experience with uh, the large bucket of things people call machine learning, and at least in an operational perspective for people who run and maintain things on a daily basis, I have never seen anything do any better than generate 50% false positive rates, which is basically crap, mm. in all honesty. And, and the best I've seen at it is around 50%. Um, now, what you can do, and, and especially what Jason suggested, is use it as, uh, as an additional tool you know, in your tool chest, something that gives you more leverage. Um, for instance, uh, Uber has a, uh, in their monitoring system, they have, it's basically a metrics oriented platform. They have a front end to it that basically classifies incoming metrics as either being inline or outlying. So a thing that is conceivably might be outlying, they shunt off to a different process, which then learns from these outliers over time and classifies them and, and classifies them differently and then people can decide whether or not to do anything about them, which I think is the absolutely correct way to utilize ML. Um, the incorrect way to utilize machine learning is to turn on some kind of algorithm and let it generate alerts. That is the single worst thing you could do. Magic is anyone. fine. Come on. Don't, <laughs> don't look behind the curtain. Well, and that actually... And we're, I know we're running up against our time here, but that brings us to the ever the perennially popular difference between monitoring and alerting. So since we've been talking about metrics and monitoring all along here, and then Anil just brought up, okay, when should you alert humans? Like I, I'm sure Anil, you have your opinions, and then I'd love to hear from Jason um, as to when you think we should be alerting people about things. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a confused face because there's no purpose to monitoring other than to generate alerts. So, so you can use a monitoring platform to do exploratory understanding of your system and iterative development and all that, but when it comes down to operations, the reason you monitor things is to figure out what to alert on, to figure out what's worth alerting on, and then to alert on whatever that is, and to do that continuously over time. Um, so so there's, there, as far as I'm concerned, there's no monitoring without alerting. Uh, now, what you should be alerting on is is all over the map, right? It depends on your scope of responsibility and, and what you care about and what your paging structure is and what your culture is and how your organization is set up and all kinds of things. Uh, but in general, my view is that um, you should only actually page on uh, 
something that takes you out of the performance envelope of your service, whatever that is, whether that's an entire application or a microservice that you run or whatever. Uh, otherwise, you know, you have to decide what's a sufficient warning level where you might want to be notified, and everything else should just be an event that doesn't notify anybody, but that you can go back and interrogate. So I, I'd add to that, and I would say, yes, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think nomenclature is really important, the terminology that we use, because, like, it's not in my opinion, it's not monitoring versus alerting. Alerting is a subset of, of monitoring, right? So you have all these different functional areas. Data collection is one, like, the most important one because that feeds not only monitoring and alerting, but it also feeds like uh, uh, capacity planning. Like that's the other kind of side of it is you have monitoring and alerting, you have capacity planning, you also have analytics. Like the great thing about analytics and, and monitoring is like you can perform it on the same set of the same data set. Right, it's, it's how you slice it and dice it that makes it operationally different or, or more useful for one scenario. Um, damn, there's something else I want to add. I can't remember now. It's fine. Oh, you know, you know what's a word we haven't used? Availability this whole time, which is kind of amazing. Ooh, um, we had a whole episode about that. <laughs> have, we said, have we thrown out scaling yet? I think oh, we had we had, hey, we had had a minutes left, Jason, before you have to leave. Let's let's open that can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> So l l let me say that uh, things have to be available, but if something is available and non-performant, it might as well not be available. So it's it's just in. I mean, this is this is part of the reason checks are insufficient because availability is is not a sufficient metric to figure out whether or not you're delivering a service you want to deliver. Right, and there's a time window there too. Like, yeah. hey, it answers eventually after 800 milliseconds, and you're like, the customers have already left. <laughs> Yeah, and and the and these three things, I mean, these three keywords that have come up, capacity, capacity, availability, and performance, are all closely related, right? You you uh, to have sufficient performance, your things need to be available, and you need to have enough capacity of resources to deliver that performance. And if any one of these three these th three things goes off sufficiently, the other two do as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so, as all right, as Stratton was mentioning, we should probably wrap things up or move towards the definite middle here. So, I would love to hear just kind of, you know, first Jason, since Anil talked most recently, first Jason, then Anil, like your final thoughts slash advice slash words of wisdom to people who are interested in this whole concept of finding signal in the noise. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, try not to chase the shiny stuff, I guess, would be the biggest thing. Like, go with what you know, and if you don't know, talk to people who do. Uh, avoid chasing, you know, the newest serverless or the, the newest machine learning. Start with the basics. Understand what the functional areas are. Um, how to get your metrics in, how to instrument your code. If you're not doing code, like, what, which collection agents are you, you know, comfortable with? Um, how... It, I guess above all, and we haven't. I'm surprised that we haven't touched on this at all. Configuration management. Um, like, yeah, why haven't we talked about that? Yeah, I mean, in a in a pre-serverless <laughs> world, like configuration management is, you know, it's obviously it's key. Um, I and I, damn it, we don't want to dive into this. It's it's a rabbit hole. But I want to pause. Another follow up. Now we have something wanna, to talk about next time you're on. The I want to pause this in the community. <laughs> Why don't the configuration management providers do more to integrate instrumentation of these applications and services into uh, as emitters um, to your to your storage engines? Mm. Uh, that is I that what Jason just said. Um, <laughs> Emoji that. <laughs> that's right. And the the only thing I'll add is that um, on the opposite end of it, you you can. Figure out what metrics you care about, regardless of your toolchain, and 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 you shouldn't get distracted from doing that by tools. Just it it is it is a it is no one's going to do that for no one's going to figure out what metrics matter for you. That is a thing you have to do, and that is a thing that will stand regardless of what tools you choose or the or change in staffing or what your architectural model is or what your culture is or what your organizational model is. Um, if, if you don't take responsibility for figuring out what metrics matter to you, no amount of money and technology is going to do that for you. The hardest part about monitoring is figuring out what you give a shit about. Right? <laughs> I'm going to piggyback one, one thought onto Emil's statement there because I totally agree. With regards to tools, 
Like, if it's painful to use, try something else. Like, you couldn't say that five years ago, but there's so much choice out there in the ecosystem right now. Like, if your if your graphing tool or your dashboarding or your collection agent just doesn't feel right, try something else. There's so much choice out there. I, I actually am one of those few rare oddities. Like, I enjoy building graphs, really complex, unusual graphs. <laughs> if I had to use some of these other systems, like, it would drive me nuts. And that's why I enjoy Graphite. I enjoy the API. Like, other people may not even click for them. Like, try different things. Find something you like and that you're effective with. Awesome. Well, so we're going to try to squeeze in our last little bits here uh, so we can let Jason go uh, appropriately, go do his stuff. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any checkouts. I had one I wanted to share that uh, my coworker and uh, DevOps Serati and Automation Serati, John Kaiser, shared with me the other day, which is it's uh, Zish Auto Suggestions. We'll put a link in the show notes, but it gives you the fish like auto suggestions, but for Zish. And it's super cool. And I'm sure that Ben Hughes is probably listening to this and is going to be like, dude, I like did that two years ago. You're so behind. I'm never as hip as anybody else. But Wait, are we, we're pronouncing it Zish? I, I don't Zish. actually use it, but I'm, I'm just kind of bashful. ZSH is what I thought. I, I always say Zish. <laughs> and, and I think, I'm pretty sure that when, that yeah, in the episode with Ben a year ago, I think we had a conversation about like the hipper way to say it. I don't I've never heard that. You've never heard it as Zish? No. Oh. And, and now, just to be different, I'm going to go, go around calling it B-A-S-H. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so checkouts, by the way, like, and I don't necessarily have something newer, and I think I've probably talked about this before, but I've been super happy with Hugo lately. So uh, Steve Francia, is that how I pronounce your name? Uh, thank you, because we've really been enjoying it both for Arrested DevOps and for DevOpsDays.org now. You know what was the coolest thing, and I have to be honest, probably one of the reasons I decided Hugo was super rad was when I realized it was Steve who really has the SPF 13 Vim configuration that I adore. <laughs> and I was like, that's you! Of course I'm going to use your thing. But yeah, it's 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 a static site generator written in Go. It's it's pretty cool. It's what drive, drives the rest of DevOps. Like, okay. uh, anyway, so yeah, check it out. GoHugo.io, I think. Something. Jekyll's over, people. It's Hugo now. It's hip for your <laughs> .af blogs. <laughs> nice. Jason, I expect serverless.af to be running on Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so community and stuff, speaking of DevOps days, um, if you have an upcoming conference you'd like to see us promote here on the show, fill out this form at arrestedevops.com slash cons, that's C-O-N-F. Uh, upcoming conferences... Uh, there's a lot of DevOps days. Go to devopsdays.org. The website usually works if Bridget and I aren't breaking it. Uh, you can try the code ADO2016 to register for any of them. It's probably going to get you 20% off. Oh, uh, and speaking of upcoming conferences, Jason has a very important announcement, Remonitorama. Remonitorama? Is that like Remonitorama <laughs> Redux? Or do you mean like in relationship to... On the topic of... Oh, I like I like the idea that there was... A, I thought there was a new conference called Remonitorama. <laughs> it's it's news to me. I, I think his announcement is that you can't go because there are no more tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's it's awkward because I'd love to promote it, but we <laughs> always sell out like months before, so I don't want to tease anybody. But uh, I think it's a great event. I enjoy it. Um, uh, we get a lot of people that come back every year. Um, so it's kind of like, it's the conference for if you're like me and you, you don't like, I, I won't say multi-track, I'll say significantly large multi-track where you end up and you can't decide what you want to do. You, you're having like regret for the ones you want to um, and you end up going to hallway tracks. Like I, it's a single track, it's specifically curated for like-minded individuals. Um, and I don't know, I, I, get, I put a lot into it, I get a lot out of it, I think it's fun. I love Portland, so... Next year, hopefully. If you're not going this year, try again next year. I'll, I'll get there one of these times. <laughs> I have the biggest FOMO when it comes to Monorama. So, so Monorama, the conference that gives you lots of FOMO if you can't go, but no FOMO at all if you're there. <laughs> and and people should make efforts to go to more smaller, focused, higher quality events like Monorama and SRE Con, where where it's it's a small number of people who are all kind of trying to solve the same problems and do the same things that can actually share what's going on. And as much as I might tease the, you know, around the silly word, like the I heard the serverless conference was actually really good. Like people are 
talking in smaller groups about the really focused things they're excited about makes for a good conference. The charity um, majors did a couple of really exciting. <laughs> sorry, Matt. <laughs> I was going to say I was like she did a couple of amazing like uh, recaps. Like I guess mm -hmm. one of her talk and then two of the kind of the concept of serverless in general. Mm -hmm. Fantastic uh, article. So we should post something. About yeah, that. everybody should read chair. That's that's Jason's checkout. Charity.wtf. Um, uh, by the way, so DevOps Day Silicon Valley is June 24th through the 25th. Uh, Minneapolis is 20th through the 21st. Um, of July. Of July, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, we have like 521 people registered right now. The hotel I'm says not, we can't fit more than 700. Stratton is not one of them. I'm, I'm very sad. I'm really mad. But, but um, the I know single, uh, Signal Effects is sponsoring, but Anil is not one of the people coming. <sighs> okay, Bridget, you're not coming to Chicago, so it's cool. I'm going to be in a canoe in the Boundary Waters with no internet, with my phone locked in the uh, safe at the Outfitters. It's going to be fantastic. So, hey, if you want to go speak at some conferences, uh, DevOps Days, Dallas and Raleigh's CFPs are open uh, till June 19th. Philly's is open till June 30th. New York is until July 15th. Singapore till August 15th. Detroit, August 31st. Um, uh, Port Porto Alegre is a new city for DevOps Days in Brazil. Oh, that um, one's going to be exciting because the DevOps Day is, is going to be entirely in Portuguese. And the website is so in Portuguese. The, website. <laughs> so, <laughs> the pull request is kind of like YOLO. Like, I, I guess that's okay. Uh, Baltimore is new this year, too. Um, and, yeah, the uh, don't forget we have a newsletter. You go to restdevops.com slash banana stand. It's the best way to know about upcoming podcast episodes, cool news with DevOps. By the way, if you come up with some cool news with DevOps you would like us to share, hit us on the Twitters and tell us about it. Um, that's always helpful. So I'm not just asking Bridget and Trevor for ideas. <laughs> All right. Thanks to our sponsors. Be sure to visit them at arresteddevops.com slash 10th magnitude and arresteddevops.com slash datadog. And we'd appreciate it as and we'd appreciate it if you'd visit arresteddevops.com slash iTunes. You could leave us a review in the iTunes store. Maybe we'll read them again on the air someday when we remember. Yep. Um, Professional uh, podcasters. <laughs> we're having fun. Yeah. Uh, you can um, check us out at Arrested DevOps on Twitter. Give us ideas, input, feedback. The mail to shows at ArrestedDevOps.com. Stratton will definitely read it. We have a Slack bot that'll put it in Slack, and I won't click on it to expand it, so it's probably yeah. fine. It's awesome. Uh, <laughs> and any comments or thoughts you have on this this episode, eventually you'll be able to go to ArrestedDevOps.com slash signal in the noise and uh, comment and let us know what you're doing for monitoring. Um, so yeah, so it's been awesome to be on the podcast again. Uh, <laughs> it's thank been you. Awesome. It's been awesome to have guests, to have Anil and Jason. Thank yes. you both so much for coming on. Jason's right. not going to say anything. He's just going to wave. No, 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 because <laughs> now you know there's video. <laughs> no, I appreciate you having me back. Uh, I don't know why you chose to have me back, but I'm grateful. <laughs> Well, Cheslock's been on a couple times too. <laughs> too. So there's a floor to this thing. We just haven't found it yet. Um, Wait, am I the alternative Cheslock now? <laughs> uh, Anil, we are really, really grateful and excited that you came on the show. It's pretty awesome. Thanks for having me. It was great. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I'm Matt at Matt Stratton. And I'm Bridget at Bridget Crumhout. We're Arrested DevOps. And remember, there's always DevOps in the banana stand. <laughs> oh yeah, I have to stop broadcast. <laughs> no, you don't.